pleasure this morning to introduce our uh, visiting professor. Uh, professor Rafe Devere White began, as you'll soon know, in uh, Dublin, where he went to University College and did his uh, urology training eventually in Duke, spent his early years in Boston and New York, and for, the, for 22 years was professor and uh, head of the Department of Urology at UC Davis in California, and for the past 12 years has been the director of the Cancer Center there. Currently, he's president of the Society of Urologic Oncology and also currently the editor of the World Journal of Urology. Now, Rafe is really the, I would think, the original surgeon scientist in urology, and he continues to be that. He is so involved both with clinical and basic research. He's well-funded and highly, highly respected around the world for the research that he does. Rafe is uh, really a, one of the most well-rounded urologists that I've ever known. And, uh, I mean, he's involved, as I said, with research, administration, um, community service, editorships, socioeconomic issues, the AUA, and on and on and on. He's a real who's who in the world of urology, and it's really a great honor to have uh, Professor Devere White here this morning to give us grand rounds on prostate cancer and secondary chemo prevention. Great. Barry, thank you very much. Uh, nice thing always about an introduction like that is it can only be a disappointment. So, uh, and I must say it's uh, very nice to hear of you to have me in, in this lovely city. And so we're going to talk about secondary chemo prevention. So I think if you, my view of prostate cancer at the moment are that we really sort of have three problems, at least that we focus on. The first is that we are clearly over-treating a number of men with prostate cancer, and that's what we're going to talk about now. Uh, the second issue is that when we withdraw androgens from people with prostate cancer, their PSA goes down, but regrettably their cells don't die. And the third thing and I, is that we are spending an inordinate amount of time and money trying to work out what happens when prostate cancer cells become androgen independent. But that's like sort of trying to work out what you do when the, all the pens and divisions are sitting in the city. It's better to work it out before they get there. So I, I think that those are the three areas. So secondary chemo prevention is what I want to talk about. Now, this is just sort of my definition of secondary chemo prevention. The disease is diagnosed. And I think that's, that's, that's we will come back to that. But then we want to use a non-toxic intervention to either slow the disease to stop the disease or eliminate the disease. And in most secondary chemo preventions, the latter really isn't going to occur. Now, from a patient's point of view, they want you to do this without increasing their chance of dying from that uh, disease. Oh, thank you very much. Um, so I think when you talk about non-toxic interventions, and uh, you will see why I'm going to come up to this, obviously they have to be less toxic. Maybe non-toxic is never quite... Uh, possible. And one of the things I think you're going to see a fair amount about over the next coming years are what are the secondary cancers that we get in patients that we radiate. And I think in prostate cancer, when you're radiating people in their 70s, this sort of wasn't there. Now that we're radiating people in their 40s, I think it really is. And you may have seen that very nice paper recently for patients who had <coughs> testis cancer and got radiation, and their rate of secondary cancers is really close to alarming. So I think this toxicity issue is going to become much more in. So we all want to cure this disease, but I think that what we would like to do while we're waiting to cure it is maximize screening and increase prevention. So uh, I, you couldn't pick a better disease if you want uh, prevention of it. I mean, it's got a long natural history. Doubling time is probably at least seven years, if not more, when you start. There is a high prevalence. There's still many men diagnosed with it. And there still is a lot of men that are dying of this disease. So if you look at primary prevention, and if you look at PCPT and other studies, I, here I think is the problems with it. First of all, whatever you use, how long do you have to use it for? I mean, in prostate cancer, maybe years and years. Then, <clears throat> since a person doesn't have a disease, you've got to deal with all of those things of smoking, getting overweight, what we eat, what we don't exercise. And then if it's a pill or a diet, I mean, if you go into Watts in Los Angeles and tell everyone they're to eat broccolini for 20 years, I mean, it's not what's on their list. I mean, they can't afford to get health care. Then the other issue is, and we're great at this, is we want one plan to fit all. I mean, 
people of different repair enzymes, people of different metabolism, yet we will come up with a plan that absolutely everyone has to do. And then people get worried about side effects. I mean, if you're taking something for years without knowing you have a disease, and then I think the hardest thing of all is, and it's something like prostate cancer, how do you ever prove it works? So that's why we sort of didn't tackle that. And this is just one thing from the prostate cancer prevention trial. You need to treat 71 healthy men for seven years to prevent one case of prostate cancer, and at least half of those cancers are going to be insignificant. So I think as a public health system, uh, that is an awful lot of money and an awful lot of treatment. And personally, though Ian Thompson gets very cross with me, but I think a very little benefit. So, if you look at secondary chemo prevention, I think it's more likely to be accepted, because after all, you have the disease, so you're going to have to decide what you want to do. It's going to be relatively, I'm going to take out the word quicker, it's relatively quicker to prove it works. And it should be considerably less expensive, because you're going to lay off your expenses against expenses of, you know, surgery or radiation. And I think if you look at cardiovascular disease, and cardiovascular disease is always held up as the one in which we've made so much progress. But, you know, a lot of progress comes from the fact that if your cholesterol just bumps a little, you take a statin. I mean, some people have said statins should be put in the water, and I'm not sure that they're not right. Uh, I mean, if your blood pressure goes up one thing, you're racing, you're a little beta blocker, a little uh, something. And I don't know how many of you are, but certainly you take your baby aspirin. And if you look at what's happening in cardiovascular disease, if you add in, if you can stop smoking, I mean, that'll account for about 80% of the progress we've made. So it's not something that can't be done. So I probably don't have to, to well, maybe I do have to convince you of it. I am a believer that PSA screening saves lives. So that you have to sort of factor in. If you look at prostate cancer death rate, and you go back to 1993, it was nearly 35,000. And in 2004, it went down to 29,000. In 2006, it went down to 27,500. And Fortune magazine, always a good reference point, looked at those 04 figures. And if you take the population growth, that is a 24% drop in per capita death rate. Yes, there was a blip in the death rate before, so you can say it's just leaning out. But I can tell you, if we had dropped in that time the death rate from breast cancer 24%, I mean, they'd be lining up to know who to give the Nobel Prize to. I mean, women would be out there saying that it was just, you would not be elected if you didn't uh, screen to do this. And we have been rather too quiet, I think, about the benefits. And if you look at all the death rate in cancer that we talk about, and 1% death rate in the States in cancer turns into billions of dollars saved, we'd be much more vocal about it. The second thing I think is if you look at stage migration, and the other cancer where we looked at this in is colon cancer. And in colon cancer, stage migration has translated into saved lives. No one questions it. So if you, I mean, if you just go back uh, about 15 years, about 30% of people walked in had metastatic disease. It's probably now about 3%. Uh, the node positive rate, this actually was Mitch Benson uh, from eight, 1989, not that long ago. 22% of people with radical prostatectomy. It's now down to around 2%. The pre-PSA margin positive rate I took from David Paulson's group. So this is people operated on for a nodule, 30% were margin positive, And their early PSA one has dropped to 15%. Probably it's lower than that now. And if you look at T1C, it's about 84%. So we clearly have changed the demographics. Now, what this is, this is a computer-generated model. And Alex Sadikoff, who was with us and is now in Michigan, did this. And very interestingly, your colleagues down in Seattle at the Fred Hutch have also done it in a slightly different way. So what the red and green line are uh, is the actual drop in prostate cancer mortality. And the red line is what the model predicted, and the green line over here is what it actually is. So the model was absolutely right. The black line is the, what the model says the prostate cancer death rate would be if we did not have PSA screening. So this represents your lives saved. But this represents the people diagnosed whose life has not been saved. So... You screen to save these people, you do secondary chemo prevention to try and not over-treat these people. That would be the idea. And 
one can, you know, at, at the time of diagnosis, about 50% of prostate cancers are no immediate threat. I know everyone talks about insignificant cancer, and it's just not a word I like. I mean, you turn around at 49, it's not an insignificant cancer. The other pet peeve I have is everyone now talks about cancer as a chronic disease. Um, I'm not sure if you have pancreatic cancer, you're going to think it's a chronic <coughs> disease. So I don't think can prostate cancer is insignificant. I think what we're just trying to work out is in five-year increments, if I don't treat it, are you going to be harmed? Because obviously, the longer those five years go, the less you have to deal with side effects, the less expensive it is, and the chance for other things to intervene. So the opportunity, I think, is you, you maximize the benefits from screening because you find the cancers whose lives you save. And then if we can do secondary chemo prevention active surveillance, you minimize the risk for screening because you minimize the risk for over-treatment. And so what we wanted to do was how could we make active surveillance sort of truly active. So this is another way of looking at it. If you look at the incidence of prostate cancer, it's about 170 per 100,000. If you look at how many of those will die of prostate cancer, it's about 32. So 138 of them die of something else. Now, one thing that's always very interesting is if you present this, and I've heard Larry Klotz do it quite a few times, you present the, this as an active surveillance study, you know, we will all jump up and say those poor 32 men that died. I mean, oh my God, if only you treated them, they wouldn't have died. So the first question, of course, is how many of those 32 men would die no matter what you did? Because we don't cure all prostate cancers. So that's the first thing. And secondly, it is 32 of 170, so you're around 15%. So the 15% is significant. So I don't think you can just pass this off and say, gosh, we shouldn't be screening. But what we would like to do, and none of us have yet done, is come up with a decent marker that'll find those 32, or at least more of them. And I think that's where we're working at. Now, active surveillance, everyone talks about. I mean, there was a very nice conference a year ago down at UCSF. It was very well attended. It was all in active surveillance. And you'd have sworn that, I mean, everyone was out there putting patients in active surveillance. And this is the CAPTURE database. 8% of men suitable for active surveillance in the states go on it. And <clears throat> that's probably an exaggeration. The other problem, and I think it is more a problem maybe uh, with us than with you, is that if you take people who do go on active surveillance programs in the States, half them come off it. And they come off it mostly just because they sort of get spooked and they just don't want to do it. So you got to remember when you look at these are two papers, they're now a little old, but 33%, a third of them have withdrawn in basically two years, and you got to remember this isn't a third of the general population. This is a third of the 8% who said, okay, I want to do it. So we just thought that just telling men to go on active surveillance wasn't going to work. The other thing I think if you want to put someone on active surveillance, the huge error is I think you have to tell them about it before you biopsy them. I mean, I, I think, and I don't know about you, but certainly at least half the men that come in to have PSAs are told to do it by their wives. Why do I want a PSA? because prostate cancer tr kills people. So if we find the cancer early, we're going to cure you, you're not going to die of it, okay, I'll have my biopsy, comes back and you say, great news, you have prostate cancer, we don't need to do anything about it. I mean, that is just a disconnect. So I think if you believe in active surveillance, I think you have to tell people before you biopsy them that if they have insignificant cancer, active surveillance may be what you'll recommend. And if they have more aggressive cancer, then you're going to recommend something else. And I think that very, very few urologists do it, and we could have a discussion about why. So this is our efforts into uh, our sort of uh, secondary chemo prevention. And I took a slide out. So let me just tell you uh, that how I got into this is there is a, co a company in Japan called AminoUp, and maybe I have it later, but just in case I don't, and uh, they are very involved with the nutrition department uh, at UC Davis. And, you know, our, our school was founded as an agricultural school. There are 11 varieties of strawberries. All of them actually come out of Davis. Uh, so they have a tremendous hookup. And this company interacts with the nutrition department. And they uh, have supported the clinical trials. All of the basic science work we did in our lab, and I, I supported that. So you'll have to just 
take that into account. So the first thing we looked at was AHCC. AHCC is actually an extract from mushrooms. And as always happens, you know, I was given a desk just folders full of testimonials about how cancer had just absolutely washed away CAT scans and everything else. And since it was a capsule and it was totally non-toxic, I said, okay, well, we will take people who had diagnosed with prostate cancer, an elevated PSA, and said they didn't want any other treatment for six months. And we will give them a HCC and see what happens. So pretty standard outline here. And we reported this uh, a couple of years ago. And as you can see, uh, we did miserably. I mean, we did not move down the PSA in a single patient. And two things are very interesting, actually. There's some very good studies out of uh, Rochester looking at AHCC in people with septic shock. And it actually does do very nice things to your actual immune system. And if you look at some of the nude mice, it actually did a little in them. So it probably has something to do with immunity, but it did absolutely nothing for prostate cancer. So we sort of learned our lesson at that time. And then they had GCP. Now, this is a genistein-rich uh, compound. And uh, what they have done is they've basically taken soy, uh, they ferment it, and they turn the genistein into genistein so that it is much easier to absorb it. So, uh, and it's very interesting. I mean, if you go, I went over there just to look at it. It's like walking around the Napa Valley, except all the vats and everything are cleaner, but it's the exact same thing. The other thing that we did do is we took uh, three separate batches that they sent us, and I had it analyzed. And it really does have the amount of genistein in it that they say is in it. So, because they actually have quality control of their complementary medicine. So, we took this. And the first thing you could say is, well, why can't I just go on eating my soy? So what I'm showing you here is the actual amount of genistein in soy or soy milk or tofu uh, as compared to the amount of genistein you get out of one of these capsules. So there is absolutely no doubt about it. If you haven't been doing your soy all your life, this is a way that you can certainly catch up quite quickly. The other thing that would be more important is we looked at serum daisine which is probably actually more powerful as an antioxidant than is the genistein. And this is looking at blood levels. Now, these blood levels down here are actually from a Japanese study, and they looked at people who said they had high soy intake all their life, and this was their serum level. And this is the serum level in someone who's actually on it. So again, you really can get much higher levels using this than you can using compounds. But having been sort of fooled once this time, we said no. This time, no matter what they gave us, we wanted to go back and do some animal studies before we went back to the uh, patients. So this is a study in, in nudes, and it's using PC3. And that, that becomes important because PC3 is no androgen, active androgen receptor. And this is the control animals fed water, and this is the animals gavaged with GCP. And we stopped it here because these animals, the tumors, were just getting too large. And probably which we didn't, we, we really haven't killed the cells. But what we have really done is stopped them growing. And we took a number of these tumors and looked at them, and there was a molecular signature. I mean, you turned up P21, you turned up P27, we turned down VEGF, and we had increased tunnel. So we felt we really sort of had some sort of mechanism and it really did work. So we went back and took another 62 patients, or 64, and again, the same thing. You had to have prostate cancer, had to have an elevated PSA, didn't want anything done for the next six months. So these here are patients who have had surgery, radiation, or a combination thereof, and once again, we really didn't do anything. These over here are 13 patients who are in active surveillance, and eight of them stabilized or lowered their PSA. So the question now, is there an explanation about why this might happen and this didn't? Well, the first, of course, is there's just pure chance. But the second one, of course, is that these patients have an intact blood supply to their prostate cancer. And these patients really don't. So it may be just a matter of how you concentrate the genistein 
And the other is the group in Detroit have done very nice studies where they've actually looked at tissue, and the prostate actually concentrates genistein. So whatever level you get in your serum, it's actually higher in your prostate. And the final thing, of course, is these may be patients with just lower decent scores. They respond better. And the final thing is that since the cancer may not be a huge part of what's making the PSA in these patients, again, could this just be that you're actually affecting something in the normal cells? So we set up this randomized uh, study, and this time all of these uh, 64 patients were going on active surveillance. And so they get registered, and half of them got GCP, and half of them got a placebo. You get your PSAs at three and six months. If the ones on GCP have a stable or lowered their PSA, if they want it, we go on giving it to them. If the ones in placebo want the uh, GCP, and absolutely I think everyone did, we crossed them over. Uh, we then took uh, PSAs at 9 and 12 months, and we looked at where we were at. And uh, the people who had a stable or lowered PSA, uh, we, we continue, and we continue to give some of those GCP. Now, it, it, it's sort of interesting. It looked to me like, based on what we had done, and we did prior calculations, that this was a fairly reasonable approach. We did not put in that everyone had to prostate biopsies uh, for two reasons. We weren't sure everyone would accept it. And the second reason is because healthcare insurance companies at that time would not pay for it because it wasn't really a standard care for active surveillance. And the company said they didn't have the money. So um, that's why we didn't do it. I wish we had. So here's, here's what happened. 53 patients actually completed this study. And as you can see, I mean, they're fairly typical, and there really was no great difference between them. Now, you're going to say, why only 53? It's because the others had dropped off, and I'll show you why. So where are the side effects? And I've got to tell you, giving 5 grams of something that you show has a biological effect in the lab, I don't think that worries me. I mean, how can you be cha making molecular changes and having no side effects? And one of the reasons is we can find absolutely no action of this when you look at normal cells. And all of these, these are why people dropped off, and they're really all related to capsules because it, there was an equal distribution between the GCP and the placebo. And I think one of the reasons is these capsules were made for the Japanese population who were smaller, so we ended up having to give up to about 15 capsules. And I think this was just a reaction to the cellulose and the capsules because uh, every single one of them went away as we stopped them, but we lost some uh, to the capsules. The other thing I thought was very interesting, uh, we took blood, sent it to Alabama, and Alabama uh, did all of our blood analysis. And 19 of the 20 Caucasians, clearly based on genistein dacine levels, had absorbed it. We had three African Americans, and they did not absorb, based on their blood levels, one jot of it, which is interesting. And I remembered I'd heard this, uh, that, in, that in North Carolina, in, in Wake Forest, someone had looked at this, and it found that there was some SNP, and they didn't absorb it. And I'd gone back in the literature, I talked to them down at Wake Forest, and everyone denies it, can't find it, but I'm positive I saw it, so we're going back to look. So this is just to give you a sort of an idea of how people had increased their genistein levels. Now we come to the bad news. Despite how I thought we'd set this up, and you don't have to trouble yourself to look through it, we looked at GCP, we looked at stable, we looked at reduced, we looked at increased, we took a sort of greater or lesser than 20%, and there just is no difference. Uh, of the, we, we started a biopsy of people as they came off, and it was interesting that the first uh, four patients we biopsied, three of them had no cancer in there. So this raises a few questions. First enough, you could ask, okay, if you look at Larry Klotz's very elegant work, I mean, so Larry really doesn't begin looking at it until these PSAs for two years in terms of making any decision. It was hard to give people GCP for two years before you were going to make a decision. But Aaron Katz has published on giving a much lower dose of GCP to a patient. Uh, the PSA, as you see, preoperatively went from 19 to 4. And at a radical prostatectomy, there was no cancer there. Now, you could say, okay, that GCP did. And, of course, another possible explanation is that this PSA was drawn too close to when the patient had a biopsy, that this actually represents just a post-biopsy PSA, and it was just a very small volume of disease, and they found it. So 
if you write that, the people who don't like complementary medicine says, right on. And if you write that, the people that do like complementary medicine says, you see a bias. So, but Fritz Schroeder published on 10 weeks nutrients, and he looked at PSA doubling time and found a difference. So it didn't seem like six months was an unreasonable time to look at it. We looked at PSA DT and absolutely found no difference. And yes, we, Larry did share with me his PSA uh, calculating system, and we still found no difference. But if you look at the other active surveillances, this is what they looked at it. So the three out of four, and this is now five out of six, uh, is that due to the effect of GCP? Or is it due to the fact that these are small volume disease and your biopsy just misses it and it's nothing to do with it? I don't know. But I think it does raise the question, if you're going to make decisions in active surveillance and you're going to do it in that year period, I'm not sure unless there is a, a, you know, a dramatic change in your PSA, we shouldn't base it on what's on that biopsy at the end of the year. So I think that we have now gone to the fact that everyone gets re-biopsied and wants to go on active surveillance. And if you want to go on a nutrient supplement, it seems to me reasonable that what you do is you give them it for their six months a year, and you then do your biopsy. And I'm not sure if you find in a 12-core biopsy no evidence of progression, that that at least at that time isn't as good a monitor as we have. So while that was going on, we did come back and ask in the lab, first of all, could we make it more effective? And secondly, you know, did the basic science data actually support what we were doing? So as I said, I, I think in prostate cancer, the real key is you withdraw androgens, and those prostate cancer cells you sort of initiate this molecular survival program. And if we could interfere with that molecular survival program, then maybe we actually could do better things. So here is Allen Cap cells grown in fetal bovine serum. And the hundreds in red, because this is the serum concentration we got in our patients. And clearly, you stop cells growing. If you look at these cells, as you know, there's a huge turn on of fossil AKT when you withdraw the androgens. And about 15% of the cells actually go into apoptosis. Now, if you use Wartmanin, that is a dirty drug, but it'll certainly knock down fossil AKT, you get about 75% of the patients going into apoptosis. So the question is, can, can we do something like that with something you can give patients? Because you can't give patients wart manin. So here is uh, some flow cytometry results. Allen cap on the top. And as you see with the vehicle, very little in the sub-G1. If you put in GCP, you go from about 5% to nearly 18%. And this is very reproducible. So we clearly are helping cells go into apoptosis with GCP. Down here is showing you one of our P53 uh, mutants in Allen cap cells, and this is the vehicle. This is GCP. So again, not as much, but we have put it up uh, so the same amount. This is LY, which uh, is another blocker, and this is LY uh, and GCP. So clearly, the GCP allows cells to go into apoptosis, either by itself or by making it easier once you blast the phosphor AKT. And remember, this is a P53 gain-of-function mutant, so it's sort of acting in the opposite direction. So we asked, could we safely block phosphor AKT in patients? And yes, uh, using paraphosphine. So paraphosphine is also a dirty drug, but you can give it to patients with relatively minimal side effects. So what's up here, and it's the only one I want you to look at, is the Allen cap cells with, uh, with paraphosphine, and I think you can see you really have actually killed some of those. Now what this is, is Allen cap cells with a constitutively activated uh, P53. You put in your paraphosphine, your, I mean, uh, fossil weight KT stays up, and you do not kill the cells. So yes, there may be other things going on. Yes, it's a dirty drug, but clearly, there is a major difference whether that phosphate AKT is able to be activated or not. If you look at a clonogenic assay, and if you just look over here, here's your GCP. It really has dropped it. Here's your paraphosphine. It's down to about 40%. But look what happens when you give them in combination. You really wipe it out. And someone's going to ask me, but wouldn't it be much easier just to use Casadex instead of GCP? And I don't have it on the slide, but I tell you, Casadex does nothing in terms of increasing it. So it really, again, did look like it. So 
Another way of looking at this was we looked at power cleavage as a sort of another signature that we really were killing some cells. So here we are in fetal bovine serum. Here is your part, and you see there's not much difference if you look at it between the vehicle, but looks what happens when you put them together. And here they are in a charcoal strip. So again, this would support that clonogenic assay. We really are doing something. So what's the mechanism of action? So first of all, we wanted to see if we increased the inhibition of AKT, and I think here you are with paraphosphine, but if you look, you've dropped it, but when you put in GCP, you literally wipe it out. Uh, the other thing we have found is that we interfere with, uh, uh, with uh, mTOR. Now, it, it, everyone's using rapamycin these days, and uh, if you use rapamycin, you're down mTOR, and it's meant to do lots of good things. So one of the problems of uh, it is that you actually elevate your androgen receptor. So it's not great to take a person with androgen-independent prostate cancer, give them rapamycin, and turn on their androgen receptor. So one of the great things here is if you look and you look at PSA, what happens is you actually downregulate your androgen receptor, you downregulate your PSA, so there's PSA, and this is showing how you downregulate your androgen receptor. So there really is a mechanism of action, and if you put the two together, and that is shown up here, you get even more downregulation. So if you both down the GCP and you downregulate your androgen receptor, is the, is the effect only seen with androgen withdrawal? I mean, is GCP just going to do there? And the answer is no. And now, uh, this is uh, Phil's Max work, and this is looking at docetaxel in, in different cell lines and different treatments. So what you're looking at is an increase in cast space 3 and 7 as an indicator that you're actually are getting these cells to die. So here's your SARC inhibitor, and, and Chris Evans is... Uh, got the contract looking at SARC inhibitor in patients. And as you can see, it, it really, it does turn on your cast paces. But when you come out here, look at GCP and, and SARC, you really have turned it way up there. And as you can see, putting in ca uh, Casadex does very little. So this has an effect across. Now, but this again is showing your part cleavage. So if you just come to the end, this is clearly most upregulated and that is GCP and your SARC inhibitor. So clearly, and if you come back down here, you'll see your SARC inhibitor alone does not do nearly as good a job. And this is just another way of looking at this. So clearly, if you put GCP together with something that antagonizes prostate cancer cells, you get an increased percentage of those cells going into apoptosis. And if you send prostate cancer cells into apoptosis, they are not going to come back. So this is the trial that we would now like to do, and I say like to do because it's just a little issue of money. What we'd like to do is take the testeride, and the testeride, as you know, will lower your intraprostatic DHT by about 97%. So that would be our way of lowering the androgens. And we'd like to compare that to a group of patients that get to testerize GCP and paraphosphine. So the idea is we withdraw androgens, we block the phosphor away KT, and we help the cells go into apoptosis. And this time we would do both serum uh, markers and we would do prostate biopsies. And uh, if we can get this funded, uh, this would be our next study. And these are the people who uh, do all the work. Uh, Stephanie runs all the uh, clinical trials. Uh, Parmita does the mTOR work, and uh, Root Vinyl is the person who, uh, with Cliff Tepper, did uh, the basic science work I showed you. So, thank you very much.